I feel a little bit bionical. I feel a little bit bionical. Um, can we can we trust that that the advancer is going to work for sure? Did you test? No, I didn't. Well, it's not. Oh, just um, yeah, because nobody's seeing it right now, right? Unless you want front row. For some reason, I was thinking it was showing to, uh, out there to everybody. Yes. Okay, not to you ready. Yeah, we're good. Cool. So, are you ready for me to turn it on? Sure. So we're now live, not with the audio yet. But uh, we've no. got. We'll yeah, I'm gonna get. Okay. How did you do that? I just found it on the web. Just stole it. That seems to be the thing. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're not stealing it. We're borrowing. We're borrowing, liberating it. We're that's right, and that's legal. I like that. Let's see. Okay. Well, I don't know. Whatever, whatever they're. Um, yeah. Okay. How are you? Yeah, I think I think I feel a little bit bionical with all this stuff on my head. <laughs> no. Once they fix the audio in this room, we'll only need one. Yeah. But we've waited two years. My version of psychology's top ten mysteries. There may be some professors here in, or students in the room who may have other ones that they'd like to add to the list. And be, feel free to add those when we get to the end. But this is my version of psychology's top ten mysteries. I hope, though, that if you are not a psychology major, that you will be able to kind of transpose this to your own field. Because every field of endeavor has its big mysteries, and it's the greatest people in the field who know what they are. So that's the ultimate goal I have for this evening. So let me begin with my mystery number one and the story of Wilder Penfield. I'd be surprised if many of you have ever heard of him, but whoops, what did we do? Hello, tech person. Uh, oh, here it is. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Now there are 11 <laughs> mysteries in psychology. Wilder Penfield was a neurosurgeon in Montreal around 19. 
50 is when he reached the peak of his career. And different kinds of things depending on which part of the brain he was. No, I still don't want whatever they want me to want. Don't you hope that something terrible happens to Bill Gates somewhere? <laughs> Anyway, we were in the middle of brain surgery, but if you want to have the experience of brain surgery, that is, if you want to have the experience of flashes of light without light, have you ever tried poking yourself in the eye? Have you ever done this? Um, I used to lie in bed at night as a little kid and poke my eyes. And I would uh, go ahead and try it if you haven't ever done that before. Clo close both eyes and then just kind of press in the, in the corner like this and see if you don't see a flash of light coming from one side or the other. You see that? Those are called phosphenes. And I would call my mom into the room and... <laughs> Which one is it that I, what did I do? Keep the current color scheme. I know this, this is one of those um, superstition experiments, and I'm the subject. <laughs> Hopefully it won't happen again, if so I will stand here. Okay. <laughs> Through the optic nerve and back into the brain. No light ever gets into the brain unless you're having brain surgery. So the mystery here then is how, do, how does the brain create light, our sensations of light? What is such a compelling feeling that we're seeing light when all we're really seeing are patterns of neural impulses? That's mystery number one. And the practical value of this, for example, is that they are now trying to develop um, prosthetic eyes for the blind involving implants on, in the um, occipital cortex of the brain. So far, it's not very good, but it's as good enough to look like a time and temperature uh, sign with dots on it that you might see on a bank or something. And they can use that well enough to avoid furniture and animals and other people. So it's a there is some practical value that will come out of this. The mystery, again, is how does the brain create light, not out of light, but out of neural impulses itself. Now, mystery number two involves my experiences at the K&R Drive-In. Anybody been to the K&R Drive-In in Southern Oregon? Probably something that was programmed into me by my experience or my genetics. And so I, I try to deal with that and order my ice cream. And just for fun, I'd like to maybe take a little poll and uh, see how you feel about ordering ice cream. Do you think that my choice or your choice of ice cream when you go to a place like this is primarily or more than not a hereditary thing? Or do you think it's more environmental you know is it ex uh, in my case was it something my mother or father always ordered and so I imitated it or was it something that was programmed in my genes to love chocolate how many of you would for the most part but not exclusively because we know it's both how many of you think it's primarily a hereditary thing just raise your hand and how many of you think it's primarily environmental oh interesting I was gonna and then the rest of you just couldn't care less right <laughs> no I think that was just about everybody so um, psychologists believe I think every psychologist in the room and would you agree that that our behavior and our 
thoughts, Roy, would you agree, are being, I do believe in free will for me, maybe not for you. Uh, it's either that or I'm uh, genetically wired always to be right or something. You know, you know, it, that's a possibility. Well, anyway, that's, that's the, the mystery. We don't know exactly how heredity and environment interact. And that becomes important lots of times when you, uh, if you're a teacher, when you're dealing with uh, kids and you see their IQ scores. And you begin to wonder, is, the, are they, is that a fixed thing that they're programmed with uh, by their genetics? Or is it something that's, that involves the environment? Uh, so uh, we need to figure that out. And to answer the question, why should we care? There are a number of... Um, factors that are strongly influenced by the environment that we know. Not all together, but strongly influenced by the environment, such as fears and phobias. You know, we learn those, uh, usually. Uh, social skills, manners, of course. Attitudes and prejudices. Uh, strong hereditary influences often include speech patterns. And if you saw the, the movie The King's Speech, you know that there can be a biological and uh, possibly hereditary component. Food preferences sometimes, handwriting styles, temperament, many uh, mental disorders, we think. Uh, intelligence has a strong uh, hereditary component. But for you as students, you ought to think about academic success curve, where most people are. Uh, and it is arbitrarily set at 100. Now, every few years, the IQ test people revise their tests because some of the items be, uh, become a little dated and maybe some of the answers get out, things like that. And they, they revise their tests and then they give the test, the new test, to a new group of people, but they also generally give the old test to the same people to see how they compare. And it's been an open secret for years that the people uh, that take the new test and the old test generally score a couple of points higher on the old test than they do on the new one. And think what that means especially if you project that back over a period of years and maybe decades, it actually could mean that your great-grandparents were mentally retarded and they thought they weren't. So the Flynn effect, exactly as he, as he said, involves this gradual creeping up and up and up of IQ test scores over the years. And it creeps up at a slightly different rate depending on which tests you're talking about. Because when IQ tests came out in the, in the teens, uh, then uh, I think America began the slowly going test crazy. And we began testing people more and more. And I think, I think you're exactly right that there is an effect there. I'm not sure that accounts for the whole thing. Um, and, um, and it's hard to, to prove it. And, but what aspect of culture? Yeah. But the end, yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we do find this effect, well, uh, on the, um, where am I? I've got to point this in the right direction. Uh, the Ravens matrices test is a relatively, we think, culture-free intelligence test. And it actually has been going up at a higher rate than the other kinds. So uh, one of the clues we have, let me show you some of the other things that are probably not involved. Um, it's not TV or computers or the internet, obviously, because it didn't go across that whole span of time. It's not cell phones, it's not Facebook, it's not wars, disease, vaccinations, any of those things, educational changes, uh, except maybe more test taking, as you were saying. It's not limited to the US, it goes on all over the world. And we don't know exactly what it is. It's too fast for genetics, 
one of the clues is that, and for Einstein to say, I have no special talents, is an amazing statement, it seems to me. I'm only passionately curious. I'm well aware that I have no special talent. Curiosity, obsession, stubborn endurance combined with self-criticism have brought me to my ideas. You're beginning to see a pattern here. Maybe curiosity is running through this. It's a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. Of course, at MCC, that's not a problem, but at most other schools. Information is not knowledge. The mystery that I want to point out is that we know almost nothing about what curiosity and creativity are. And we know almost nothing about how to nurture them. I think there are a few businesses that are doing a pretty good job of this. I, I gather if you work for Google that they uh, have found some ways to encourage creative people. I think schools often, as Einstein said, don't do a very good job because it's a lot harder to deal with creative kids than it is with kids that color within the lines. So even though we don't know much about creativity, creativity has brought you all of the blessings and curses of modern civilization. It's brought you the ballpoint pen and the laser, the ATM, post-it notes, credit cards. Number five, I'd like to introduce you to one of the most creative psychologists I know of. And his name is Roy Baumeister. He's not maybe well known in the media, but among psychologists, he's a, a well known fellow at the University of South Florida. And he has what I call a risky proposal. The mystery is how are men and women different? Now, I suspect you have some suspicions. It, it, would anybody say they're not different? Shoo. Sure. We used to think that men were more mechanical, better at math, better at science, engineering kind of stuff, and women uh, were more verbal, better at literature and, and reading skills, that sort of thing. Um, but that idea is disappearing. Almost all of the differences between males and females in terms of abilities that we used to think were true have either almost disappeared or disappeared entirely. So it's pretty safe to say there, there are no uh, or very minimal abilities differences between males and females. Does anybody have any ideas as to what the main difference is? I'm not talking about biological differences. Get your mind out of the gutter. Uh, let's, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Expectations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, um, any other kinds of things? Um, Anne Peplow, incidentally, uh, believes that the main differences between males and females are motivational in the sense of, uh, like, aggression, that, that sort of thing. And Roy Baumeister has his own explanation, but I wanted to see, are there any others that you would add before I tell you what his risky proposal is? More broadly, can you give an example? Uh, like, so if it's a, a goal or an expectation you want to um, then you can get more nervous on how to get around it and not think about it. Do you think so? Okay. I, I know, I, now I know from personal experience, and I won't name any names, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I know that uh, when a problem I exists that, I think I know this, that uh, men like to solve it, and men and women like to exchange emotions about it. Is that is that fair, or is that am I being sexist? I'm willing to be either. Uh, yeah. Another one is recently is a genetic. This has happened to the female. Your 
Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, he says that uh, men are generally society's biggest winners and biggest losers. Consider both of those. And, uh, but he says the averages are the same in, uh, with men and women. Um, and um, let's, let's see, where's my... Oh, I thought I had another slide in there. Okay. Um, Men are uh, among the uh, corporate leaders all over the world. Men uh, tend to be um, among the, the rich and the famous more than women. They tend to be at the top end of almost anything except the female entertainer spectrum. Well, that, that makes sense. <laughs> and I, I know you're saying, well, yeah, they're bigger and they're bullies and they push women around and so, of course they are. But then if you look at the other end of the spectrum, what you're going to find is that there are more men in mental hospitals. There are more men in institutions for the mentally retarded. There are more men in prisons. There are more men, uh, men die younger men that get society's nastiest jobs. Uh, and so his, his idea is that men are more, more variable. They, they go to both extremes more. Now, yes, as they can with as many uh, females as they can. And it's, uh, for women, the advantage lies in being very selective with which men they breed with. And uh, that results, of course, in men lying and cheating and saying, I love you, dear, and I will be with you forever. And uh, women, you know, the, the game gets played based on those biological constraints. And that's, that's where Baumeister is coming from. But, I mean, that could be where it's coming from, like what, how we develop those cultural norms. Mm -hmm. but Do you think, do you think we're that smart? I think we could be. We could be, yeah, yeah. We'd all have to go, no more, and then move on, but that would be such a hard. But the mystery remains, and that is uh, men and women, are, uh, men are the biggest winners and the biggest losers. The averages are the same on all abilities, but it could be that uh, one alternative that nobody has suggested yet is that men are actually inferior but they're just bullies and they knock women out of the way. So. Well, moving on to mystery number six. Can you see where I'm going with this one? Yeah. Uh, evolutionary psychology, again. Uh, and it has to do with the issue of, uh, not issue, but with the uh, question, the evolutionary psychology question of homosexuality. Why hasn't natural soul anymore? So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that homosexuality has an element of abnormality. I'm suggesting that we haven't explained its existence from a, an evolutionary standpoint, which may mean that we uh, have to do some revision of evolutionary theory. We know that, um, that homosexual behavior is uh, relatively common among animals, other animals besides people. And so why does homosexuality persist? And again, I have some answers, but I don't know, I don't think I have the answer. We might begin by asking, might begin by asking Shakespeare. If you've read or seen Troilus and Cressida, it's a story about the Trojan War, or as the Trojans called it, the Greek War. But anyway, the um, Troilus and Cressida is a story about Achilles and about his lover uh, Patroclus. And uh, I think Shakespeare, if he were sitting here, would raise his hand and say, homosexuality for the Greek warrior was a 
good protective device because somebody, you have a really good buddy that has your back all the time. And so maybe that's an advantage. <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I wish I had thought of that. Maybe. I hadn't. It's like that. Produces homosexuality as an incidental byproduct. But, uh, and it ha it's neither good nor bad, but it has um, an advantage for the group. Well, yes? Uh, uh, most of the descriptions you came up with were examples of why bisexuality might be a reasonable thing. Sure. It doesn't make sense for homosexuality. Because those people that succeed and continue on and all of that, if they're strictly homosexual, they don't breed. So none of those traits get carried on. It Unless, and here, here's the, the interesting thing, uh, I think, for the biologist, is that biologists believe that survival of the fittest operates on an individual level. Um, it's uh, one person survives and passes their traits on uh, because they breed. But, and many biologists, if you suggest there might be an advantage to the group, will say, no, that's wrong. That Darwin never said that, and it, it just doesn't doesn't work. Uh, so now uh, homosexuality is beginning to, I think, um, as people try to explain it, they're beginning to entertain the idea that if you have a certain proportion of people who are homosexual in the group, that it might give one group, let's say, a group of soldiers uh, that represent the town of Athens might give them the advantage over the town of Troy. So it's a, is there a group kind of thing? When, um, sense that he called de-individuation, which has to do with kind of anonymity, <laughs> and um, it's the kind of process that happens when you're, um, let's say, a soldier and you put on a uniform, you're de-individualized, and uh, you, the individuality is, is, they try to remove that. They do that in boot camp very effectively. And I thought it was going to be a joke, and it wasn't when I went to boot camp. Anyway, uh, so Zimbardo was interested in those kinds of things. And in, in order to uh, do an experiment on that and see what the, the power of those uh, pressures might be, he ran an ad in the Palo Alto uh, local newspaper saying that the psychology department would pay $15 a day, which was big dollars. Well, it still is to me, but uh, I'm just a poor retired person living on a Social Security. My wife's Social Security. Uh, $15 a day for two, one or two weeks. And uh, so he had a bunch of applicants and he uh, had them take a bunch of mental tests and he screened them, tried to make sure he didn't select anybody that was uh, mentally disturbed, and um, got 18 people that he finally came up with. All were male Stanford students. Now I know that we're going to have an issue about whether females do the same thing, but um, they do. All male Stanford began degrading the prisoners, calling them all kinds of names, and there was especially interesting that uh, there was a lot of homophobic kind of harassment where they were, uh, things like having one prisoner go up to another and put his arms around him and say, I love you, that sort of uh, thing that was sort of what you would expect from maybe sixth graders, but not from Stanford University students, would you? who were randomly selected and screened for mental health. Well, here are some of the things that were happening. You can see some of the images. Zimbardo, that, now you'll recognize Roy, this looks more like you now. <laughs> uh, this is Zimbardo a few years later. Uh, he assigned himself the role of prison warden, and he got so caught up in the experiment that he didn't realize how uh, degrading and brutal things were getting. And in fact, one of his graduate students, whom he later married, said, Phil, we've got to stop this. And so after six days, he called it off. 
and began analyzing the data and feeling bad about what he had done. Well, the, uh, I think one of the main conclusions that comes out of the Stanford Prison Experiment is that the world is not divided into good guys and bad guys. Now tell that to Wayne LaPierre. Uh, that is, Wayne ran over them both and missed them by just a fraction. Saved the guy's life at his own peril. The situation wasn't more powerful than the person at that point. And do you know her? Yeah, she was the one who was uh, also a, a kind of celebrity after she recovered. But she is a Pakistani girl that was uh, advocating women's rights and uh, women, particularly women's rights to be educated in, um, in Pakistan. And she was shot in the head by the uh, Taliban, survived, and is going back and doing it some more. You know, here again is a person that was not um, a victim of the situation. So what we don't know, the mystery is, it's called the person situation controversy. And we have evidence that sometimes the situation is more powerful. But we also have evidence that sometimes the person is more powerful and we don't know how to empower the person. You know, if we knew more about the person situation controversy, we could do that. leave you with that thought. Well, let's go on to mystery number eight and uh, Dr. Rosenon and how he drove psychiatry crazy. <laughs> in order to be uniform, in order to, uh, he had every one of them say the same thing. They all expected that they were going to be exposed as frauds and embarrassed. But what really happened was every one of them was, uh, was admitted after a brief interview and all but one was admitted with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and all were kept in the hospital until they could prove that they were sane. Uh, the average was like 18 days it took them uh, to get released and one poor subject had to be uh, in the mental hospital for two months before he could get out. The thing that uh, Rosenheim thought was so amazing, oh, incidentally, uh, if you haven't seen One Flew or the Cuckoo's Nest, it's a celebration of the same kind of thing. Uh, there's a young Jack Nicholson, and if you, if you haven't seen that, what I recommend is that you have a Jack Nicholson weekend where you rent all of his movies, uh, starting with this one and then and see the rest. But anyway, this uh, tells you something about mental hospitals and the power of the situation. The two main findings, though, of Rosenhan's experiment were, number one, normalcy was never discovered by the staff, ever. Not a single patient was ever discovered to be normal. And when they released them, they released them with a diagnosis, typically, of schizophrenia, a problem of trying to diagnose people with through their clinical judgment and with checklists of symptoms. And so if somebody says uh, they are hearing voices, it's almost certain that they are schizophrenic or you know one of the major uh, mental disorders or that they have there are some other possibilities, but this is the thing you think of. And so uh, the psychiatric community cried foul very loud when Rosenon did this. And you can't blame him. So Rosenon said, okay, um, you didn't pass the test the first time. I'm going to do the experiment again, but I'm not going to tell you which hospitals. <laughs> and so hospitals all over the country started finding people that were normal, that ha and he didn't send anybody out. <laughs> so it's, that's why he called it on being sane in insane places. Uh, and the problem is, I, and I don't blame psychiatrists and clinical psychologists for this because they don't have all that much to work with. A lot of experience 
And the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, easier for you to say, uh, fifth edition that just came out, that has lists of criteria for different mental disorders. But there's no really objective kind of thing, and we desperately need that. Now, if you're a student interested in psychology and you're interested in this problem, that's something that maybe you could solve, aren't I think. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mystery number eight. Then, can we find objective tests for diagnosing mental disorders? Uh, and the tragedy uh, also involves the people that get misdiagnosed or missed. There are people who are misdiagnosed, and then there are people that are simply missed. And the tragedy that we saw last week, wasn't it, at uh, Fort Hood again? Uh, occurs when somebody is has lost control and we don't know it until the tragedy happens. Well, uh, let's uh, take a look at another story on a lighter note. And again, some of you may know about this if you have uh, taken a class in cognitive psychology. But for the rest of you, let me tell you how Sigmund Freud met Bugs Bunny at uh, Disneyland and what that has to do with any mysterious thing about psychology. Um, you need to know a little bit about Freud's model of the mind and uh, to kind of oversimplify it, Freud believed that uh, he, he had what he called the iceberg model, that the mind was like an iceberg with only a small part above the surface that is that was conscious and most of the mind down beneath the surface which was a reservoir of of uh, seething desires, particularly uh, success, uh, sexual and aggressive desires, but also um, repressed memory. And one of the most famous ones involved Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. Um, what Lo uh, Loftus did was to contact students' parents and would ask parents for lists of, of uh, significant uh, memorable events that happened to their children in, in childhood. And so she would give a, a student a list of these things, but she would add a bogus memory. And the bogus memory in this case was a memory of having met Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. Now, if you think about it for a moment, that can't happen. We know that, no, that Bugs Bunny never met anybody at Disneyland because he's a Warner Brothers character and would be shot on sight <laughs> in Disneyland. <laughs> okay. So Loftus would give these lists of, of memories, including the bogus memory to the student, say, check which ones you, uh, you remember. And then she'd say uh, a week or so later, well, uh, let's do this again and see if you remember any of these others. Eventually, about a third of the uh, students that were uh, doing this test remembered meeting Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. So um, it's an implanted memory made by suggestion. So the mystery here is what's the, na the real nature of the unconscious mind. Is that like Freud said, work, then you'll be rich and famous and somebody will be talking about your experiments right here one day. Well, let's uh, take a look at the last one. And it has to do with consciousness and the homunculus inside your head. Do you know what a homunculus is? It it's, uh, comes from uh, either the Latin or the Latins or the Greeks. They said everything first. But um, it means a little, little person, a little man, literally, inside your head. Let me have you do this demonstration. Uh, if you um, have you ever uh, looked at and put your fingers like this pretty close together, and then you shift your focus from your fingers to about 10 feet away. And what you'll see is a uh, little sausage floating in the middle of the air. You see that? I always loved the power of being able to do that to a group of people. Everybody sitting around going like this. Anyway. But, and if, 
if you're bored with what I'm having to say, you can just keep staring at the little sausage if you like. <laughs> but anyway, uh, now what you see there is partly what we call the result of bottom-up processing, which has to do with the stimulus, the light coming up from the, uh, your fingers and you know, uh, going in through the retina, or to the retina and so on. And part of it has to do with the suggestion that I made that you're seeing a little sausage there. And that, that's the holy grail of psychology, really. And that will make you uh, rich and famous. Biggest mystery of all, what and where is, is consciousness? Well, now, I don't poke myself in the eye anymore very much when I go to bed at night. But what I do uh, think about a lot is things like, what's the nature of consciousness? And is there really any such thing as repression? And what causes the Flynn effect? And all of those mysteries that I think were greater mysteries than what's looking back at me. Looks like an eyeball. I don't do this much anymore. My greatest hope is that, again, to reiterate, is that you will go away from this experience tonight in whatever field you're in and try to identify the greatest mysteries and think about Einstein who said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the source of 